It was the psalmist that said in Psalm 34, 3, O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. How grateful we are today to magnify the Lord in worship, for us to sing these beautiful songs of praise, holy, holy, holy. How deep the Father's love for us, above the bright blue, songs that give us promise, songs that encourage us. To see you here and to be thankful for faces that I see new each time I come. For my beloved fellow servants from the Bahamas, Brother Hannah, so good to see you all. And thankful for all that you do. I am a little bit concerned. I get up to preach. And the song before the lesson, it won't be very long. Keep that song in context. Don't apply it to your sermon. Brother Miller, they don't do the, those things to you. They saved till I get here and do it to me. So count your blessings, brother. Let's talk about overcoming. You know, it was said once that God has provided everything that we need to overcome this old life so one day he will look at us and say, come on over. I love that thought. In John 16, 33, Jesus reminded his apostles that he had overcome the world. It's in 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. If you've had yet to be born again, born of God, based upon your faith, sin is overcoming you. You have not overcome sin, and you will not overcome this world. In a few moments, we're going to sing a song of exhortation, a song of invitation. Do you know my Jesus? Do you? If we know him, we will keep his commandments, 1 John 2 and verse 3. The word know there means to experience the knowledge, which means when you understand what you need to do, then you obey the gospel of Christ. Some individuals know what they need to do. You ask them why. I don't know. Yes, you do. You're making a conscience choice. And when you and I think about overcoming the world through our faith, our faith in Jesus Christ, in whom taught us repentance of Luke 13, 3, a commandment to be observed and preached and obeyed, Luke 24, 44 through 47. On the day of Pentecost, when the gospel was preached, when they asked men and brethren, what shall we do in Acts 2, verse 37? First word in Acts 2 and verse 38, repent. Change your decisions, change your hearts, change your direction. We confess our faith in Jesus Christ, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2, 11. Then we are baptized into Jesus Christ. There is no other way to get into Jesus Christ other than to be baptized into Christ. That is affirmed from the text of Galatians 3, 26 and 27 and Romans 6, verses 3 through 6. That's how we get into Jesus Christ. When we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever, 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. And therefore, we obey the gospel of Christ. We're raised to walk as new creations in Christ, Romans 6, 5, and 6. We walk in Christ as a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. If you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, you have not overcome sin, sin has overcome you. And I hope in a few moments, when we stand to sing that song of invitation, that you will finally make the decision to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ through your faith, a repentant heart, a mouth that brings forth a confessing faith, and to be buried with him in baptism into Christ, for those sins to be washed away, for you to be added to the church. Dear brother or sister in Christ, have you ever thought about overcoming in another sense? For in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches of Asia, each congregation, Five of them were rebuked for the wrong they were doing. Two, Jesus praised for what they were doing. But to every congregation there, he says the phrase, 
he who overcomes or he that overcomes. Reminding them that you are the church. You are to live lives that overcome sin. Hallelujah. Amen, as the hymn goes. You are to overcome sin, and you are to walk faithful for our Lord, standing before Him holy, redeemed, and walking faithful for Him. My dear brother, my dear sister, may I ask, was that your walk this past week? Was that your walk before others? Is that your faithful walk that you express before others that they see Christ in you, the hope and glory? Colossians 1, 27. You need, to be remain, you need to remain as an overcomer. But sometimes we need prayers on our behalf to help us, to renew us. Sin that we are to confess, such as Simon in Acts chapter 8. So in a few moments, friends, when we stand to sing the song of exhortation, do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are an overcomer through Jesus Christ? If not, we have shared with you what you need to do in order to overcome this world, to overcome sin, and to walk faithful for our Lord Jesus Christ. By way of an exhortation for those of us that are Christians and to establish greater hope in those of us who are not to become Christians, I want to take you to the book of Hebrews, a wonderful book for the Christian, where on 13 occasions we find the phrase, a two-word phrase, let us. When you find that phrase, let us, and you look at that phrase, it not only means the command that we do so, but the commitment in so doing. The command is there, and the commitment is so doing, in so doing, with a reminder that when we are commanded, let us do these things, and we have that commitment, God says, I am going to provide for you a blessing when you do that. The command, let us do this. The commandment is there. The commitment that when we do that, God will provide for us. And when we go further, seeing it is that can't miss opportunity, I want you to look with me now specifically in Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to begin with verse 19, and then I'm going to begin with verse 19. I'm going to read through verse 21 as an intro, and then we're going to look at 22, 23, and 24 individually. So park yourself there at Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's the redeemed individual. That's the one that has obeyed the gospel. That's the one walking faithful. In the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having an high priest over the house of God to which Timothy calls the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3, 15. And that high priest, therefore, is Jesus Christ over the house of God. He is our high priest that we read early in the book of Hebrews who offered up sacrifice once and for all. The blood of bulls and goats could not get the job done, as we see earlier in verse 10, but the blood of the Lamb did. And the blood of the Lamb redeemed you and redeemed me to where we have that boldness, that boldness, that confidence in Christ through the blood of Jesus, through his flesh. Friends, we have ourselves placed within the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. We as individuals that we noted last hour, part of the body of Christ, individuals of one another, Hebrews 12, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. And we are all there together. And we are all laboring together for the cause of Jesus Christ. And now he comes to remind us. Here are those let us blessings that we are commanded. And he says, when you take that commitment, there is a blessing there for you that we remain overcomers. Number one, verse 22. To be an overcomer. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, 
having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, once again affirm that we are redeemed and of Christ. So what do we do? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. He mentions the heart twice in this text. Jesus taught the importance of the heart in Matthew 12, 34, and 35. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. It all begins in the heart. Our decision is made from the heart. In Mark 12 and verse 30, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. There is nothing left. That heart is indeed the place of conviction to where Jesus in teaching in Luke chapter 8 and verse 12 concerning the sower and the seed, those by the wayside, the seed that went by the wayside, here's the parallel, the meaning of the parable, are they that hear, then comes the devil, takes away the word of God out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But down in verse 15, they on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Take us back to the day of Pentecost when they were cut to the heart. When they were pricked in the heart, Acts 2, verse 37, they said to Peter, men and brethren, what shall we do? They heard the preaching of the gospel. They heard the proclamation of the Christ. This same Jesus you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Those who rebelled against that Savior that walked upon that earth just about 40 days or so before, fresh in their mind, this same Jesus you crucified, both Lord and Christ. You did this. Men and brethren, what shall we do? There's got to be an answer. The heart is a place of conviction. And when they were convicted, that's when they heard what to do, Acts 2, verses 38 through 40. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and unto your children and unto as many as who are afar off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward or perverted generation. Many other words he made certain that they understood. You know, we've often thought within ourselves, when I get to heaven, I would like to ask so-and-so this, or I would like to ask so-and-so that. I would love to ask Peter, what were the many other words that you brought forth to testify, to exhort? You said more in order to get them to move in obedience to Christ. And nowadays, some preachers will preach a sermon, will look out there, and they say, if you have a need, please come. Well, they got to know what the need is, and they got to know why they need to come. And when we see Peter with many other words, he testified and exhorted, saying, save yourselves from this perverted generation. Then they, they gladly received his word were baptized in the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They were convicted in their hearts. Therefore, when the Christian draws near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, they draw near because they have a heart that's assured. They have a heart that is obedient. And notice in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking of bread and in fellowship, in breaking of bread and in fellowship and in prayers. They continued together. Let us, who are Christians, who are convicted, draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That's how we can overcome. We've overcome sin. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go to verse 23. Let's take the convicted heart. 
to be an overcomer, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering or the profession of our faith, which we'll explain more in a moment. For he is faithful who promised. Jesus is faithful and he promises. You let us draw near, you draw near together. You hold fast the confession of your hope, the profession of our faith. When you come together, when you hold fast, he's faithful who promised what God has said. As we noted, there's not only a commandment, but a commitment. When we look at the word confession, means to speak the same thing or declare openly. They were confessing their hope. By confessing their hope, they professed their faith that came from the heart. Remember 1 Timothy 3.15, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer of every man that asks you of reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Why do you believe what you believe? Your confession of hope, your profession of faith. Listen to these texts, friends, how they blend hope and faith well together. 1 Corinthians 10, 15, but having hope that as your faith grows, we shall be magnified. How about Colossians 1, 23? If so be that you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard. And Hebrews 11 and verse 1, faith is the substance or the assurance of things hoped for. I love this thought, let us hold fast which we have confessed and cling to the hope which it ministers. So where are we now? Well, from 22 to 23, to be an overcomer, now our convicted heart is now a committed heart, and it embraces the hope that is in Christ. One's hope is confessed. One's faith is professed. It is expressed with a faithful life. Why? Because he is faithful that promised, and when we trust in the promises of God and of Christ, then we ourselves will have that hope, that faith. It will not waver. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And now let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, the profession of our faith. Let us now hold fast. You see, folks, that let us phrase packs a lot. What about in Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 4? Let us draw near. Let us hold fast. We all are together. Philippians 2 and verse 1, coming out of chapter 1, that awesome chapter of faith and instruction to the church. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, and it is, if any comfort of love, it is, if any fellowship of the Spirit, it is, if any affection and mercy, it is, because of all this and because of what you have, Drawing near, holding fast, all of this fulfill you my joy. That you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also in the things and in consideration and in the interest of others. You see, we can overcome when we draw near with a true heart and when we hold fast the confession of our faith. Now, that applies to every one of us individually. But when you take everybody individually and we draw near and we hold fast, take me to verse 24, as we consider overcoming, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and the good works. Let us consider one another. 
Boy, when you look up that word and research it, it's got meanings from here to yonder. Consider to learn thoroughly, to note accurately, to consider closely, to be aware. Consider one another. Know what's going on. Brother Steve mentioned the bulletin the bulletin board's information. I look forward to getting the bulletin each week for two reasons. Me living away, I love getting it by email, and number one reason is I want to know what's going on. And number two, I want to see how late Carolyn sends it out. She's been sending it a little early. She's turning in early in her old age. Yeah, you can tell her I said that. But I love to know what's going on. You see, folks, when you think about consider one another, see, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast. Now let us consider one another as all of us are drawing near and holding fast. Back to Philippians 2, 1 through 4. We consider one another. We look closely to one another. We want to know of one another. Jesus taught love one another. 1 John 4, 7, John's writing, love one another. Jesus, this, by this shall all men know you are disciples if you have love one for another. John 13, 34, and 35. Edify one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Serve one another. Galatians 5, verse 15. Church, when you get down to it to be an overcomer, we need one another to help us overcome. And let me give you a news flash, church. You cannot one another by yourself. You can't do it. You cannot one another by yourself. You need me. I need you. That's why it's important for us to let us draw near. Let us hold fast. Let us consider one another to stir up. Old King James Version used the word provoke, which means to stir up, but in a good sense. Through the years, that word provoke has been used in a negative way, but back then it was a positive way. I heard somebody say, let us consider one another just to provoke. No, that's not what we do. We stir up. We excite one another. We press onward to love and to good works. I need you, you need me. How about Hebrews 3.13? But exhort one another day by day, so long as it is called today, lest any one of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Did you get that? You see, if I'm by myself, I can very well become hardened. Sin will deceive me. Exhort one another day by day. You put all this together, church, you press onward in love, you press onward with encouragement, we press onward as we serve. We do not neglect the fellowship of Christians. We need one another. I take us back to Acts 2, 41 and 42. When they obeyed the gospel, they gladly received his word. They were baptized that day there were added 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. You see, when they came together, they continued steadfastly. They assembled together. In the long ago, there was a certain village in Europe and it's the story of a nobleman that wanted to leave a legacy to the local townspeople when he had passed on. After he thought about it, he decided to build a place of worship. Now, in building this place of worship, no one saw the completed work until it was finished. And they were marveling. They were amazed at its beauty, its completeness, and what all it was, how well it was laid out. And then somebody looked up and said, wait a minute. 
Where are all the lanterns? How will this place be lit? The nobleman pointed to the brackets that he had built into the walls. And he told them, after he gave each family a lantern, he said this, you bring this with you every time you come to the assembly. Each time you are here, the area where you are seated will be lit. But each time that you are not here, that place of the building will be dark. Friends, let's think on that for a moment. When we neglect the fellowship, when we neglect the worship, when we choose not to draw near, take heed, consider one another, when we fail to do that, our part in the building, in the church, is not lit. Our light is not shining. Our salt will not flavor. Our city on a hill will be hidden. Parallel that with Matthew 5, 13 through 16. We're neglecting our area. We're neglecting our responsibility. Friends, are you with me on this? Everybody's all together to be an overcomer, to let God tell us to come on over one day. Everybody's together, let us draw near with a true heart. Gotcha. Everybody's together, let us take heed. Gotcha. Let us consider one another. Gotcha. But you can't do it by yourself. And when you fail to bring your lantern, your life, your part of the building is not lit. In Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, when we're taught to speak the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You see, we draw near, we take heed, we consider one another. It all comes from the head, Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together. And do you know that we are the body? Every joint, effective working, every part does its share, and edifying of itself in love. That's how we're able to overcome, to one day hear the Lord say, come on over. Now, I want you to look at this with me, just as a way of an exhortation. And friend, if you need this as a little extra spark, when you take 19 through 21 and see what God has given us and what he does for us through obedience. And you take verse 22, let us draw near. You take verse 23, let us hold fast. And you take verse 24, let us consider one another. You don't have time for verse 25. Not forsaking, that means a choice. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Folks, when we've got, once we've got 19, 20, and 21 smack dab in the heart, and then let us draw near, let us take heed, let us consider one another, and you put all that together, you will not have to deal with verse 25. Once you got 19 through 24 in line, you don't have to worry about forsaking the assembly because you won't. You'll see that encouragement to come together, to be together, that every one of us has a part and what we need to do and what we need to be about. 
And that's how we overcome. I'm thankful to look in this area and I see a walker here and a walker there and a walker here and a walker there. That's a commitment right there, folks. Nothing's going to stop. Oh, I do realize there are many times that individuals are sick, individuals have struggle. Don't you think Brother and Sister Brown would love to be sitting right there right now? We realize there are times that a person is unable to assemble. There's a difference in me unable to assemble and able and I choose not to. There's a, we understand that. I mean, I love my brethren, but I don't want somebody walking in here with a 102 degree fever and flu. And the next thing you know, everybody's out sick. That's not the way to consider one another. Folks, I'm trying to remind us of something that's very easy to do. And to be reminded that the most important thing in this life is for us to overcome this whole world and to live with the Lord in eternity. And when we draw near, when we take heed, when we consider one another, based on all Jesus has done with us, we don't have to worry about forsaking because we are overcomers and we need not one another as we press onward in this journey in life. Now I began earlier talking about the obedience of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to bring this lesson to a close by doing the same. If sin is overcoming you and you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, you see what is before you and the blessings of let us Draw near, take heed, consider one another, and you will not walk alone in your sin. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you believe in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins today. Change that direction. This is finally your day. Confess the name of Christ at this very hour, just as they were in the New Testament. You can be buried with him in the waters of baptism and have those sins washed away and added to his church as one who has overcome sin and the blessings that await you. But dear brother or dear sister, remember he that overcomes. If you have failed to draw near, you have failed to take heed, you have failed to consider one another with decisions in your life, and you're slowly finding yourself pulling away, here's the chance for you not to listen to Satan, not to allow him to snatch that word, but to come back with your brothers and sisters in Christ, come back together as one another. Let us pray with you. Let us pray for you to be renewed, restored if need be this day. We want to leave here as overcomers. Let us be overcomers in Christ. And if you need to become an overcomer today, then will you come now as we stand and while we sing?